Yes, we've had a whirlwind three days here in Kansas City. And um, I arrived on a flight late Wednesday. Does anybody remember the wind on Wednesday? <laughs> so I, you're probably so tired of hearing these jokes about the Wizard of Oz, uh, whether you're from Missouri or from Kansas City. But I put on my Facebook page that I arrived at the airport on a house. So <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, so I've been doing inclusive education work since 1985. And the second year that I began working for the Institute on Disability at the University of New Hampshire, we started what some of you may know as a partners in policy making program. Anybody ever heard of that? It's, it's a year-long leadership and advocacy training program for parents and for self-advocates with disabilities to help them identify their dreams, learn about best practices, and also learn community organizing strategies um, so that the graduates of that leadership program could not only make changes for their own children and families, but could then use those community organizing strategies to make, make change for other people. And I, I say without a doubt, um, it's, it's the power of parents to um, encourage and support and advocate change for children with disabilities is the, the most important thing I think that's ever happened in, in, in the history of, of, of disability services for children. So um, I'm thrilled to be here and um, really interested in hearing some of your stories as well as sharing some of my stories. Um, so what we're going to do today in terms of our agenda is um, you're not, you got breakfast, but you're not getting lunch. <laughs> but we're going to do definitely two breaks um, throughout the, the time together before we end at 1.30. But even in, if we're not taking a break, just go ahead and take care of your, take care of yourselves. <laughs> Um, I have, I mean, I'm up here roaming around and, you know, staying alert. And you have the harder job, which is to sit there most of the time. So if you need to get up, stretch your legs, lean against the wall, um, lie down and put your feet on the wall, and certainly, um, you know, use the facility. So don't, don't worry about doing that. Um, so let me find out just a little bit about you. Um, how many of you, are there any educators in the room who are here purely in the role of an educator, not a parent. Oh, excellent. Uh, where are you guys from? <clears throat> and what level school is that? Oh, K-12. OK. Any other educators? Yes. K-4, OK. Are there any general ed teachers here? Regular classroom teachers? Awesome! Yay! Yeah! <laughs> exactly. No principals, huh? School principals? Okay. Um, how many of you are uh, parents of children with Down syndrome who are in those transition years? Between 18, 21-ish? Yeah, which transition am I talking about? 18 to 21. Uh, how about high school kids? Parents of high school kids? Oh. Middle, OK, middle, high school. Uh, middle school children? Elementary, like, OK. Uh, parents of sort of preschoolers, three to five, great. Parents of little wee ones from birth to three? <laughs> birth to three? Any expectant parents in the group? OK, great. Um, did I miss? I know that we have some um, different kinds of uh, staff and directors here from Russia, our guests. So why don't you tell me um, uh, either the organizations that you represent or the roles that you um, are in back in back in your home country? Oh, great! Speech therapy. So the title of, the, of our work here today is trying to answer the question, is it really inclusion? So I have some, uh, uh, want to kind of do a compare and contrast between what the possibilities were 
for children and adults with Down syndrome uh, 40 years ago compared to today. And of course, I'm, my perspective is coming as a, a United States person. So in 1970, the options for work were pretty much sheltered workshops. The options for schooling or residential living were institutions or group homes. The thinking at the time was that people with certain disabilities needed to go to school together, needed to live together, and work together. The idea of integration or inclusion was really at its infancy. And of course, this is five years, 1970, before the federal special education law was passed. Certain states had already begun providing services to children with disabilities, but it was not yet a law for the whole country. And those people with Down syndrome who did go into an inclusive workplace, <laughs> maybe they could get a job in one of the four F areas. Does anybody know what the four F areas are? And of course, this is not going to translate for Russian. Food. What's another one? Flowers, working in a greenhouse. Folding, working in a laundry at a hotel. And the other one is filth, cleaning up somewhere. So those uh, vocational and employment opportunities were very limited. And today, the, there really are no limits. And I don't know if it's ever been a theme of <laughs> the Down syndrome organization, um, you know, uh, put no limits on me. But we now have the opportunity for our children to be fully involved in their faith communities, to go on to post-secondary education, college, adult learning, uh, to have jobs other than in those four F areas. Um, so this is, this is Sarah. Um, she actually works for a legal Firm. Um, she's a receptionist and is learning some secretarial skills. Um, people with Down syndrome working in the business field. A lot of people are being drawn to sort of the dramatic arts. Um, so we have some famous actors now who have Down syndrome. And people are going on to sort of typical adult lives, getting married, living in the community, um, uh, having having wide social lives, um, and essentially kind of proving this idea that my friend Kathy Snow said a number of years ago, and that is that disability is natural. And I think the idea of disability is natural um, is a theme that I think you're going to hear throughout my talk, is that I think that while I certainly um, support people with Down syndrome to have a strong identity and feel proud of having that extra chromosome, it's another kind of difference. It's making being different just the ordinary, the ordinary thing that you see in schools, the ordinary thing that you see in your communities, in your neighborhoods. Um, and of course, the reason why we're all here is one of the possibilities um, that every single child has today is being included to experience an inclusive education. So again, in my 30 years, I've heard as many definitions of inclusive education as I've, as I've known children and families. And I think everybody has a slightly different idea of what inclusion really is. Um, and so let's just do a quick little quiz. Um, so if you think that this statement that I'm going to read or this situation I'm going to describe represents what you think of as inclusion, just put your thumb up. And if you think it doesn't, put your thumb down. And if you're not sure, do a little sideways thumb like this, okay? And it's absolutely fine to, to not be sure, okay? So number one. All students with disabilities are fully included in general education classes, but because their neighborhood school isn't physically accessible, they might go to another school in their district. Is that inclusion? Not inclusion, not quite sure. Okay. 
mostly I see thumbs down. Okay, um, there are four teachers in uh, a certain school's second grade. So, you know, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Carpenter, and Ms. Jorgensen. One of those teachers has all the students with disabilities in her class to make it easier for the support staff to provide services to those kids so that those support staff people aren't too spread out. Inclusion, not inclusion. How about every student with a significant disability has a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional? Some not sure, and, but mostly thumbs down. How about um, there are uh, some first grade kids, three of them who have disabilities, that um, are not currently reading or achieving their literacy skills in the same way as their classmates. So they receive about 20 minutes a day of direct instruction by a special ed teacher. Does that fit in with your idea of what could be inclusion? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Got some both, both here. How about a large school district has a prom just for students with disabilities? Everybody's pretty sure about that one. It, 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 does it happen around here? It happens all over the country. All over the, say it again. Oh, the Guild has one. Okay. I see. Got it. High school students with into, this label of intellectual disability, whatever that is, are pull out of or never go to general education classes because they're in a life skills program that teaches them, OK, they learn things like getting dressed, setting the table, crossing the street three out of five times safely. <laughs> they're awake, Amy, yes. Um, how about students with autism attend a social skills group with other students who have autism. Interesting. You're thumbs downing that one. I'm going to read these really quickly. How about there's no, there are no students with disabilities on the high school football team? So the players are chosen by virtue of audition or tryout or talent. You still think that it's OK if there are any students with disabilities on the football team? You can tell me yes or no. Players, good question. OK. Um, there are no students in the band, no students in the drama, no students with disabilities on student council. Of course, I see thumbs down. How about a school has what they call a learning center where any student can come for academic support, although most of the time, most of the students who go to that center are students with disabilities. How does that strike you? Hmm? Yeah. Um, every day at lunch, students from students with dis oh, the students from the regular third grade classroom go to the special education room for one of my favorites: reverse inclusion to socialize with students with disabilities. Yeah. School, how about a school has a best buddies program that matches students with and without disabilities to partner up in Special Olympics unified sports? Let me see your thumbs on that one again. OK. Uh, in the CAF, all the kids with disabilities eat lunch together with the aides. Yeah, thumbs down. How about placement in general special or special ed class is based on parent choice? Huh, ups and downs. So, um, you know, I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer to any of those. Um, but when I hear words like part time inclusion, reverse inclusion, inclusion kids, inclusion room, um, inclusion time, I wonder. Do you wonder when you hear those terms? Like if somebody says, you know, oh yeah, we're, we're an inclusive school. We have 
um, you know, at every grade we have one classroom that's our inclusion classroom. You need to go look and see what that looks like. And in some of those classrooms, there could be 80% of the students in that class who have a disability. I'm thinking that's not what I mean by inclusion. And here's what I mean by it. An inclusive school, an inclusive district, is one that is based on social justice principles where all students are presumed competent, all students are welcome members, and that's an important word, welcomed members, of all general ed classes and all extracurricular activities in their local neighborhood schools. All students fully participate and learn alongside their same age peers in general education instruction based on the general education curriculum. All students experience reciprocal or give and take social relationships. Are there any words or phrases in this definition that jump out at you as really important? Welcome. Tell me why welcome does. OK. So uh, Lindsay was going, well, what do you mean by welcome? It's just like, of course, every kid should be welcomed. And then your first name? Stephanie said, we don't just want to be tolerated. Um, I've worked with many families over the year to help them get their kids included. And some of those families come to a point where they're worn out. They are worn out and they're sick and tired of people not wanting their children. And they then decide that they want their children to go to a special school where they are welcomed. So I agree with you that that word value and the welcome are important. Any other little phrase here? Yes. Fully participate. Great. <laughs> the idea of presuming competence, because kids got skills, right? Yeah. Anything else jump out of you? Yes. Alongside. Nice. General curriculum. That's right. And I will be the first person to raise my hand and tell you that um, back in, I don't know, 1988, I worked with a student with Down syndrome who was in a fourth grade classroom. And they were studying um, the uh, sort of Incas, Mayans, and Aztecs from Mexico and Central America. And the other kids were learning about the cultures of those different native, um, native civilizations. So Jocelyn was a student with Down syndrome. And she came in um, to that history social studies class. Um, that was the only time she was in general ed. And we thought, well, why doesn't she take, I swear, promise you I'm not making this up. What she'll do in the class is she'll take sugar cubes and she'll make a pyramid because pyramids were made by the Mayans or the Aztecs. It's kind of connected, but we had no thought that she might actually learn something about the Mayans, Aztecs. So that learning alongside of the general curriculum, really important. Um, so if we can, if everybody could sort of have a common understanding of what inclusive education is, um, then I like to kind of break it out a little bit more. Like, uh, uh, are there some really essential features of a truly inclusive school or a truly inclusive classroom that, that make it so? And here are the ones that I've come up with. Um, and you'll, you'll see that, um, and this is just kind of reflects my values, that presuming competence overarches everything. If, if people don't presume your children's competence from the moment they walk in the classroom, then kind of everything else is set up as a battle for the whole rest of the year. Um, and presuming competence is pretty, it's a pretty simple concept. It's, and, and just sort of speaking from the student's perspective, it means I communicate and I can learn. <laughs> you know, don't put any 
don't put any limits on me. Another really important element of the whole inclusive education process or package or whatever you want to call it is down here at the bottom that might be hard for you to see. And that is, I, I don't really see effective inclusive education happening unless there's collaborative teaming and administrative support that looks like time for people to meet, resources that teachers have to make materials that are accessible to all students. So if we sort of um, if we think of building a house, you know, we've got this really strong foundation of collaborative teaming, administrative support, and in our heads, in our belief systems, we presume competence. The next sort of most important thing that needs to be there for all of our children is that issue of membership. And here's the welcoming and the belonging part. So membership in a general ed class, and along with membership comes um, not only just being there, not just being there, but, but being with other kids, having reciprocal social relationships, not just a buddy of the day. I mean, it's great if, it's great, if, I see lots of head nodding, it's great if in first or second grade, every child has a buddy for the day. But if we start doing things like buddy of the day for Suzanne, in first grade, there are two, two, I think, unintended consequences, at least two, of that decision. One is that the buddy and the other kids who serve as buddies begin to think of their role as a helper, as somebody doing the kid a favor, as there must be something really different about this person if this person always needs a buddy and I don't. On the other side, the student with Down syndrome becomes the recipient of help. The recipient of help. And I think that not only can damage that student's sense of what they have to offer, to the classroom and to the community, but can just perpetuate that notion that people with Down syndrome are always taking from society rather than also giving something back. If we, if teachers do a good job of making sure that kids um, truly are members of the class and that that all children, that, that teacher sees her job as facilitating social relationships among all children, Oh, yeah, that's good. Then the next most important thing is that participation word. Um, and the woman here in the gray sweater um, mentioned that. And participation in general ed instruction for the purpose of learning academics and social and everything else, right? It, I also remember back in the day when the only reason I could bring to the table to argue for a student to be included was the social benefit because I hadn't let yet learned the presuming competence part. I hadn't yet seen kids who could learn the academics. Um, and when all of these things are in place, then I think we are setting up our kids to be able to learn to their optimum potential, to learn that general ed curriculum, to learn really important life skills. And how many of you made your bed before you came here today? Raise your hand. Oh! <laughs> you needed that life skills curriculum when you were in school. <laughs> Is it really essential? No. Um, and kind of everything else that people learn um, when they're in school. So um, I just want to tell you a quick story and show you a quick video. And then um, I think we're going to do a little group activity. Um, so um, Ashley is uh, a girl I met a couple of years ago. Her mom saw me present at a Down syndrome group and asked if I would come in and help her get Ashley included. So when I met Ashley, um, she was just, just finishing up fourth grade. Um, and 
all throughout those previous years, she had been in a separate, self-contained program. It was located in a public school. Um, and her educational goals on her IEP uh, were identifying shapes and colors, tracing the alphabet, using the bathroom independently, uh, finding a, like watching a favorite video like the Muppets or something on her iPad, and counting. There were some other life skill kinds of things, but really nothing that I would call good literacy instruction. She hadn't ever been exposed to science or social studies. Uh, this was fourth grade. Throughout her early years, those different things. Yes, even yet, still in fourth grade, identifying shapes and colors, tracing the alphabet. And why did you ask me that? She said, was she still learning that in fourth grade? Ah, on your son's IEP kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit of a red flag if you ever look at a student's IEP who's 14 or 15 and you still see identifying colors on it. It's a bit of a red flag. So I went to observe Ashley to meet her. I'd met her mom at this event, and then I went to school. And I'm sorry? Oh, no. OK, let me go find somebody. The technical difficulties? No, no, I can find you. Oh. No, don't worry. Oh, I'm so sorry. OK. I have to start over. I definitely think they need to hear Ashley's story. Yeah, 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 yeah. I totally agree. That's inclusion. <laughs> I'm sorry that I wasn't picking it up. Do we have what? Oh, gosh, yes. But you can ask them anytime. Okay, so life skills? Uh-huh. Uh -uh. And see, 